Good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Galea, you've changed your set, <laughs> <laughs> your movie set. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, because it's, you know, there's, there's, there's not many things that change here, yeah? so it's a... <laughs> um, okay. Um, and no presentations today. Well, then afterwards I'll give you the presentations for, for next week. Um, okay, I think we can start. Um, uh, today's lesson. We'll resume. We were looking yesterday at um, um, railway transport, and uh, we were seeing how this process of uh, liberalization is uh, significantly different in respect of, uh, of uh, air transport. Um, some indications, I've shown you some indications now. I'll go more into this uh, one second. Uh, now, right, right here we are. Um, let me see if I can fill in this one. Okay. Here we are. So we were looking at um, um, railway transport and uh, we were seeing that uh, after the Second World War, owing to the development on one hand of uh, uh, road transport and individual, um, individual uh, means of transport, automobiles, I mean, before the war, very few people had automobiles. After the war, Second World War, the amount of people that started having cars became more and more uh, frequent and uh, sort of the great development of uh, the automobile industry. On the other hand, for, me for medium and uh, long distance trips, uh, the plane came into, air transport came in, so there was clearly a, a, a significant advantage. And so rail was somehow, and the state did not invest in um, uh, modernization of, its, of, its, of their networks. So uh, as you see here, the cause of decline, rise of other uh, modes of transport, inadequate adaptation to the rail uh, networks to the new patterns of economic activity and urbanization. So just consider how much the sort of development of towns and uh, I mean stations where they were, how they were meant to be in the sort of 19th century and the first half of the of the 20th century. And uh, um, sort of the idea that the uh, um, railways were under state monopoly and therefore um, they didn't have to be uh, somehow uh, governed according to economic principles. So they were always at a loss. They was, there was no interest in making them profitable or if you want to make them economically efficient. So the, sort of, there was no, there was not much interest in, in uh, in uh, railways except the fact of you know keeping a great number of workers employed in the railway in the railway sector the state obviously owned railway companies and therefore it was managed like at the state industry without very much attention towards economic uh, economic factors um, so uh, what do we have? We have uh, uh, that we've already seen this in previously when we were looking at the difference between services of general interest, services of general economic interest, and then services which are on the market. So, first of all, um, the railways are multi service, they can provide many kinds of service and can provide many kinds of. Uh, purposes. 
Just think of the difference between passenger transport and uh, goods transport, local transport, regional transport, national long distance transport. And so hypothetically, they could be significant economies of scale in the management. If you have a network, obviously you have economies of scale. The more you use that network, the more you reduce the, uh, the, the cost of, uh, of uh, rendering that services. Uh, so there is the, this uh, fixed structure infrastructure, which is considered a natural monopoly. We've seen why it is a natural monopoly, because uh, mm -hmm. it is, especially after the sort of very strong urbanization of uh, uh, main European countries after the Second World War, it was very difficult to find uh, land on which to uh, build an, uh, eventually an alternative uh, uh, an alternative uh, um, railway tracks, and in towns, obviously, there was it was quite impossible to build a new railway station. And then the uh, fact that uh, there are technical and legal barriers to entry. Technical, because we've seen that um, railways are very have always been a very technical um, have a very technical structure. Both trains and tracks were very technical and then, therefore they were standards. And then obviously the fact that they was a, it was a monopoly and therefore uh, nobody else could enter the market. Um, what do we have? Freight and passengers. Then passengers, we have distance, difference between long distance services and commuters line markets. So this, this already gives you an idea Long distance is uh, obviously um, has a certain, uh, we shall see this in detail. Long distance is a rather competitive market. When it comes to uh, regional local train services, they are um, obviously, uh, they don't, there are not many alternatives because often public authorities, if there's a train, they don't offer uh, a road transport and vice versa. And then uh, they are, the function is mostly a social function. Just think of commuters and students that have to reach from the suburbs, go to the town to work, school, university, and, um, and so on. And so these uh, regional local services generally are subsidized by uh, local authorities. Again, the idea that the railway infrastructure is an essential facility because it has high sunk costs. What is a sunk cost? A cost that you cannot recover. Uh, just to make a typical example, I build, um, I build a building for my, uh, for my offices and then I decide I want to relocate elsewhere. Well, I can sell that building. So it is part, it is an asset that can be sold and can be um, sort of, uh, uh, can be a profit. I was, my, my firm was based in Milan and I decided to move it to Rome. And so the building I have in Milan, which I built, I can sell it for other activities and I make money. But if you have uh, uh, this kind of infrastructure, a railway can only be used for that kind of service. It is not something that you can resell on the market. So it, this is typically considered a sunk cost, a cost that you cannot recover. Once you put the money there, well, it's there and it remains submerged. This is why we talk of sunk, something that is sunk and cannot be recovered. So um, economic impossibility to duplicate or build alternative routes. And so what do we have? Tracks, which obviously are very expensive, especially now that we have high-speed trains from an engineering uh, point of view. Signal system, ground-based visual electronic systems and related equipment, and trains are highly technological. Overhead electricity grid, I mean, throughout Europe, most trains are electric. They're sort of there's some small, regional uh, lines, they still use uh, um, fuel 
for the trains, diesel engines, but generally speaking, it's mostly electricity. Now, this electricity means that it must be generated, and therefore it means that there must be an overhead electricity grid, which is very complex to, uh, to set up and has a whole lot of uh, uh, technicalities. I mean, just think what happens if a high-speed train suddenly there's no electricity. So the train stops, and this can, be, can bring to significant... Uh, uh, disruption of services. So just to point out that the electricity through which the train mo is moving is a, a very highly engineering uh, feat. And then stations, stations, I mean, uh, stations are complex. We, when we go to a station, we generally just go there and uh, board the train and then we forget about it. But the train, the station itself is a very complex structure where we have not only they show passengers and ticketing and so on, but then we have all technical aspects and marshalling points is where trains are moved around, are cleaned, our um, carriages are assembled to the engine. So it is a pretty complex uh, structure. Big, uh, uh, big stations are very, very big. If you go to any big station, whether it is the various stations in, in Paris, which has at least four main stations, or you go to the main station in Rome, you see how complex these structures are. So the uh, fact that the duplication of the network is not a reasonable economic option because you need new tracks, new signaling system, or new overhead uh, electricity grid and obviously a new station. Just imagine a congested town, you decide you want to build a new station. Quite impossible, at least in the center of the town, it is quite impossible. You can use an existing station, but you can't sort of decide you want to locate a station somewhere else in the town. So what is a few data? Um, here we have some data which is more or less some somewhat old, it's about five years old, but even more, 10 years old. But in uh, it gave uh, 73 billion uh, turnover of um, European railways and 800,000 employees. Please keep note of these number of employees simply because this brings up, will bring up a very significant issue that we will find in uh, uh, in our, this module concerning rail transport, and we haven't found this issue in air transport or in other modes of transport. Mm -hmm. 800,000 employees means big working force. It is what we call, it is uh, uh, labor, a labor intensive activity. That is that you need lots of people to manage all this structure, the infrastructure and the trains that are traveling. So you need lots of people. And so 800,000 uh, employees throughout Europe. Uh, 20 billion in 2009, that is 10 years ago, 20 billion euros in government payments for public service obligations and 26 billion in public investment for infrastructure. We shall see what we mean by uh, public service obligations in the railway sector, and especially to what extent can um, the state invest in um, in infrastructure? We've seen with the airlines, uh, airlines, airports. Sorry, we've seen with airports, airport. And there's no possibility of putting um, sort of state investment in big um, in in big airports, in small airports, small airports, well, 25% and then going. The smaller the airport, the more you can invest in the uh, airport infrastructure. Here we see that generally the railway is seen as a complete network and infrastructure is only one infrastructure. While with airports in a country, in a sort of whether you're talking of France, Italy, Spain, or other big countries, you find one, generally one main, one or two main airports, and then you find a whole lot of regional, uh, small, medium size or, or um, small size uh, airports. Uh, so uh, here instead with railways, we consider generally the whole infrastructure. That is the whole system of tracks and uh, related infrastructure. So um, rail is critical to 
uh, the effective functioning of the European uh, economy. More than 8 billion passengers, passenger journeys are made by rail each year. Remember, uh, we were looking at um, uh, air transport, we were talking of 1 billion uh, passenger, uh, passengers uh, moved in a year. Here we find 8 billion. Obviously, this is something different because it includes uh, people who do long distance, but also people who do, are just commuting. But just to show, uh, or when you consider the population, the European population, you see 500 million more or less, slightly less. Well, you see that uh, you see that about uh, it is about 20, uh, 20 trips per person per year. So that gives you the idea of how much uh, railway transport is used. Um, so let's look at the. Uh, just to remind you. We were, we will, in the presentation of this module, uh, we will somehow follow the sort of the tracks of the presentation of the air transport uh, module. But this for a very simple reason, in the sense that the air transport uh, liberalization has been the model for liberalization of transport in other sectors. And therefore we shall see how the European Union has somehow repeated with regards to rail transport, what it has already done with considerable success in air transport. So just to show you why we're going to somehow follow the, uh, that kind of model. Keep this in mind because it's, it's, a, it's a good, uh, sort of a guideline. It gives you the idea of how, how uh, European Union law is uh, uh, structured in the transport sector, especially in air transport and rail, and rail uh, transport. So what do we see? We see three relevant markets. Uh, again, issue is the relationship between competition and state aid, market for access to infrastructure, just as we had the problem of access to the mm, air transport services. Well, here we have an access to airports. Here we have the issue of market for access to infrastructure. Then uh, the possibility of providing services on a certain infrastructure that is on those, <coughs> on those uh, tracks. Secondly, the market for the provision of traction what do we mean by traction? Uh, an engine and a driver. So if you think of a train, there's always an engine and then there are carriages or trucks, according to if it's passenger transport or it is freight transport. So there's also a market for the provision of traction. And simply you say, okay, you provide the carriages, you provide the mm, trucks, I will provide the, uh, the, mm, the engine. This is quite uh, common uh, when there's trans-border um, uh, trans uh, transport. Just think of a train, a freight train that is moving uh, goods from an Italian port to Poland and has to cross this whole lot of uh, frontiers. Think of uh, had to go sort of uh, Italy, then Austria, then Czech Republic, and then Poland. And so there are four countries and in each of these countries, obviously, what will generally happen is that the trucks obviously remain the same because the trucks are carrying whatever they are carrying. Uh, but the engine, when uh, it arrives to the um, Italian Austrian frontier, their uh, engine is coupled off and an Austrian uh, engine is uh, put on. And then when it gets to the next frontier, so just to show that there is a market for traction then international rail passenger transport, and then distinction between uh, upstream market provision of services to rail undertakings and downstream market provision of services by rail undertakings. So um, upstream market, so the company that manages the infrastructure is offering services to 
um, uh, two railway undertakings, just simply to think of it's offering uh, well maintenance services or uh, cleaning services, for example, and uh, downstream market provision of services by rail undertakings. You could have uh, freight uh, services, you could have night sleepers, they're no longer very much in use, but they could be some sort of, you are know, offering uh, uh, a sleeping car uh, or you're offering catering. So just think of these various services that are offered uh, downstream. Uh, again, we have the issue when we're looking at competition, we're looking at the O and D approach, which we've seen in uh, uh, air transport. Therefore, we look at a route, origin, and destination. So that is the relevant, uh, the relevant market. So clearly, the, the, the origin, let's say origin is uh, Marseille, destination is Paris, that is the route. So it is completely different from, uh, from Marseille to Bordeaux, from Marseille, which follows a completely different route, goes southern France and southwest France and goes. So just to point out that when we're looking at competition issues, again, just as we've seen this approach with regards to air transport, we have this origin and destination approach. And then again, distinction between leisure and business, non-time sensitive, and uh, time sensitive passengers. Well, to tell truth, this is not, maybe it makes a certain amount of sense with air transport, with low cost, and so you're going holidaying, and so you're not time sensitive. But when it comes to uh, train services, if you're going to work or you're going to school, obviously you're very time sensitive. You don't want to arrive late. And generally people who take a train generally, well, uh, high-speed trains, you tend to, you want to be punctual. So this distinction between uh, time-sensitive and non-time-sensitive doesn't make much sense. But from that, several things that in Brussels are not, don't make much sense. They're not sort of, they're sort of very, rather slow in the uptake in certain, certain aspects. They don't understand that markets are changing. It takes years before they understand that the world is somehow changing. Um, so, is, uh, we've seen that the European Union, especially the Commission, having seen the success of liberalization in the field of air transport, has done its best to provide liberalization also of rail transport. The results are not uh, as successful as in air transport. So, uh, first of all, aim of EU intervention on rail sector has never been to secure rail privatization. So there's not been saying, oh, but there's a railway company, a state-owned railway company, uh, Société Nationale Chemin de Fer, Ferrovia dello Stato. We're not pointing, we don't want to, or Deutsche Bahn, uh, Ferrocarriles de España. We are not pointing to pr privatize these, but we are want to make it possible for other companies to enter the market. So you're not looking at privatization, nor of the uh, infrastructure, nor of the railway companies, but you're trying to introduce elements of competition. So, uh, first of all, what are the um, what does the Commission say? Failure of the rail system to secure its potential market share in international traffic. Um, uh, just to consider, I mean, when you are in a big country, big from a geographical point of view, you feel less this kind of issue, sort of uh, Italy, France, Germany, uh, and Spain, which are the main, from a geographical point of view, very big uh, countries. But just think of other countries in which uh, uh, transborder uh, international traffic is constant. France, Luxembourg, Belgium, Netherlands, and obviously, and Germany. Just think of that area there, which is densely populated, lots of people working there and working, studying and uh, commuting. People, most people who work in Luxembourg live in uh, uh, Germany or, 
or France because cost of living, because they are originally come from Germany or France and anyhow cost of living is lower in Germany and France than it is in Luxembourg. So just to point out, yeah, we have very much international uh, traffic or areas where there's a lot of trans-border uh, people that move a lot from one country to another, North and South, Italian, South Tyrol and Austria, uh, certain parts of Austria and Southern and Bavaria. Just to point out that this is quite common, there are very many parts of Europe where international traffic doesn't mean that you're doing long distance, uh, long distance trips. It's simply people that move from one country to another for reasons of work or, or even of study. I mean, people that are going from, uh, from uh, Bolzano in, 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 in Italy and going to Innsbruck University, which is the other side of the, uh, of the border and you go in, in Austria. So you go into the university in Austria. So people, students that leave in the morning from Bolzano, from, Mer from Merano, from Brixen, wherever it is, and they go uh, go to Innsbruck to the university. Just to point out that international traffic is uh, mm, means a lot, especially in certain areas of Europe. And then the element, second element, and this is the main issue on which we will focus our module, is to distinguish the role of government from that of the infrastructure manager and the train operator. So you have the regulator, who at the same time is the owner of the railway company. France is the owner of Société Nationale Chemin de Fer. Germany, the German government, is the owner of Deutsche Bahn. Italian government is, through its treasury, is the owner of Ferrovia dello Stato. So this remains there, this situation, but you clearly see what the conflict of interest is. You see someone who must set the rules, but is also the owner of the, um, of the undertaking to which these rules are addressed. Clearly, if you are sort of a lawmaker and you have your own, uh, you have your own company, well, obviously you will draw, you will design these, uh, these rules in the interest of the company you own. You're not, you're not going to be interested in competition. So you're not, you, less competition there is, the happier you are. So there's clearly a conflict of interest between the government as the rules, the entity that sets the rules and the government as a shareholder, as owner of the, of the uh, undertaking that must provide these uh, services. Then obviously infrastructure manager and train operator. Uh, we've seen that in, uh, in, in air transport, the infrastructure manager is the airport manager and, um, the, and then we have airlines which are pretty well separated, although the, originally they could somehow be related to the same state ownership. But here we have, in the case of railway uh, transport, generally there's an identification between the, historically, between the uh, infrastructure manager, that is the company that owns the tracks, owns the stations, the, all the signaling, the overhead grid, so the whole infrastructure and owns at the same time the company that is providing services. So the idea is clearly avoiding a conflict of interest between government as regulator and government owner. Secondly, uh, distinguishing clearly between the, who manages the infrastructure and who provides services. Desire to put intermodal competition on a level playing field. Now this is intermodal is very important what do we mean by intermodal transport? Is when you find, when mm, mostly passengers, but also with freight, uh, we shall see a case uh, specific concerning freight, when you use a different modes of transport. Uh, mm, typically in France, uh, if you buy, you could buy it, uh, you buy a ticket on Air France and you want to go uh, sort of you're coming from Rome and you want to go to Bordeaux via 
via Paris and you have no direct uh, a flight from Rome to Bordeaux, you will find intermodal, you will get off at Charles de Gaulle, and you will find a high-speed train that brings you to Bordeaux, wherever it is, uh, down on the Atlantic coast towards, uh, I don't know, Poitiers or whatever, whatever not you're going. So you go in that direction, or you want to go from Rome to Orléans, you go to Charles de Gaulle, and then you will find a train, a uh, high-speed train that takes you directly to Orléans. So you see, intermodal transport is when you have different modes of transport. Um, typically it is air transport plus train or vice versa, but you also find other forms of intermodal transport, for example, um, rail plus bus. Um, typically in certain uh, countries where there are skiing resorts and train does not arrive up in the mountains, you arrive in a station near the, at the level not high up in the mountains, and there you find a bus uh, service that takes you up to the mountain skiing resort. And this is quite common in most, uh, uh, most countries that look on the Alps, that is uh, uh, France, Italy, obviously Switzerland, uh, Austria, and Germany. So you, that is typical intermodal. So you, you change in your passing from a train to a bus. Or you might find it, and this again, intermodal uh, system, you find also possibilities of uh, um, sea. Uh, you arrive by sea in a certain uh, place and then whatever passengers or freight are moved to another uh, mode of transport. So this is intermodal, um, intermodal uh, transport, uh, but also intermodal competition and we shall see specifically the very strong competition between uh, traditional um, airline services, air transport services at the medium range and uh, uh, high speed trains, which are highly, they are competing very much one with another. And then the, I, the further element that must be considered, what happens in this, we've seen this with, uh, with, uh, uh, with air transport, the fact that infrastructures local regional airports were financed, promoted by uh, regional authorities. We saw the Charleroi case, but what happened throughout these years, these last especially 20, 30 years, increasingly transport policies have been passed by the central state to local and regional authorities. Uh, you find this in most European, big European countries, that transport is organized on a regional basis. And so it is up to the uh, region to finance these, uh, uh, these activities. Uh, who pre uh, no, it wasn't a presentation, but when I presented the Altmar case, that um, case by the European Court of Justice uh, on the issues of public service obligations on compensation for public service obligations, the issue came from a, a region, a Northern German lender, uh, which concerned uh, uh, the provision of regional, local regional transport services. So just to point out that uh, increasingly we find no longer the state involved, but uh, local and regional authorities involved of, uh, of in the uh, financing of uh, uh, transport services. So just to point out that this this means that there are different levels of decision. So uh, you would find a national level of decision on main infrastructure, but then on certain services, you would find a regional decision. And not necessarily, there is coordination between the national level and the regional level. Um, so what is uh, the system? On one hand, the commission wants to liberalize the market, on the other hand, the states say, yes, okay, you can liberalize the market, but don't think we are going to give up our control over railways. Why? Because as we shall see, these uh, companies, these railway companies are very big. They have enormous amount of employees, great number of employees, 
when you start distributing, uh, distributing these 800,000 employees throughout, uh, throughout Europe, you see that the, compared with the countries, these are very big um, undertakings with lots of uh, workers, and there are lots of workers means a very, very strong trade unions. And, uh, and then obviously it is a way in through which somehow you can sort of keep some kind of social, um, social appeasement. I mean, you find that the, you maybe this a railway is not has too many employees um, as related to what it must do, but uh, well, you don't you don't care very much because you are uh, concerned of uh, sort of social welfare. You're not very much interested in having a sort of very efficient railway, and you want much prefer giving lots of work to lots of people. This means that you you somehow can government whatever government can somehow increase its popularity and sort of distribute work to people who are looking for work. So it is states did not want to lose this control over these very this very big uh, industry. Yeah, we have different models. So uh, on the, and you see certain countries, smaller countries like Netherlands, favored an approach based on liberal market driven policy, which uh, best suited a compact trade in the economy. So obviously, people use a lot of trade in the Netherlands, but the Netherlands is a small country and has enormous amount of transport, trans border, um, trans border. Uh, services, especially, and we shall see a case on this, um, the um, uh, freight services that start from the, start and arrive uh, from the, the, this, maybe the biggest port in Europe, which is Rotterdam port, and therefore uh, they are very much interested in developing that kind of activity. While other countries such as uh, France, Germany, and Italy, and as you see, the, the, it is the size of the country which um, suggests different approaches, much of uh, more use to extensive state intervention in the provision of both road and rail transport and wanted a common transport policy that would allow such intervention to continue. You have a very big, you have a very big uh, uh, territory, you must cover all this territory, you have uh, in the case, I mean, um, just think of Italy as a very good case. It's very long. I mean, it's, it's smaller from a geographical point of view than France or Germany, but it is very long, very extensive. So if you want to go from north to south, well, it is, uh, uh, it is 1,000 kilometers. If you want to go from northern Italy to Sicily, well, it's nearly 1,000 kilometers. France, which is much bigger than Italy, well... Yes, you would have to go from, well, if you go from Champigny to, uh, uh, to Pau, uh, down in the, in the, um, in the, in the um, uh, French uh, Pyrenees, well, that's pretty long, but it is, uh, uh, some countries are more complicated. Italy has lots and lots of mountains, much more mountains than other countries. So just to point out that you, when you want to provide these, uh, uh, social services, these transport services, this universal service, well, this requires <coughs> a very extended network, and this means uh, having lots of people that are there working, and you say, okay, but I'll give them, I'm giving work to people, that I'd rather have them uh, working not very much, but rather than having them unemployed. So, uh, what have uh, mm, we seen in 1996, the Commission starts uh, thinking of how to develop this, uh, uh, this system and to liberalize. 1996, as you see, is well after the packages on the liberalization of the air, uh, air transport system. So we start much later, at least 10 years later. And uh, what does the commission say? Well, railways have been largely insulated from market forces. 
governments have a certain responsibility in that they often did not allow sufficient managerial independence and imposed obligation without compensating fully for the cost involved. They also failed to set uh, clear financial objectives, but subsidize it loss or let that pile up. Because obviously if you're state owned, you're not interested. It's something, it's something that you put on the, on the budget and you say, well, I have, a, I have a railway company and I just, whatever, whatever the deficit is, the losses are, well, I repay them. And this is a logic that is, which was a logic typical of all countries. It's not of one country or another. You have a national railway company and if their company loses, well, um, the taxpayer will pay for that. If the taxpayer pays for so many things, taxpayer will not notice that he or she is paying also for the losses incurred by the, uh, by the railway company, which also has, it's a form of redistribution. So sort of people who have affluent people who can pay taxes are somehow subsidizing people who have less and need the railway to go around and to go to work or to go to school. And so uh, at a, at a low, at a, um, a very low rate. So it is a form of um, welfare redistribution. So uh, um, in 1996, which is 25 years ago, start the European Commission starts thinking of how to develop uh, a new policy for what concerns railway transport. And so what do we find? We find a whole lot of um, directives they're directives, not regulations. So they need to be implemented by the member states. Only later, subsequently, we will find regulations. First of all, a directive in 1991 on the development of the railways, then develop, um, directives on 1995 on licensing and on the allocation of railway infrastructure. So. 1991, it's a framework. And then what do we have? 1995, the notion of licensing of railway undertakings. Remember what happened in the, in the air transport, licensing of air transport, uh, of air transport companies, the certificate, uh, a license, an EU license, and um, uh, airline operating certificate. So somehow similar and then allocation of railway infrastructure capacity and charging of infrastructure. Here we, again, what do we have? Access, it's the notion of access to an infrastructure at, um, like it was the issue of access to an airport and charging of infrastructure fees, just as you, they were, fees were set for uh, the, um, what the airport fees could be. Here we have, um, the issue of fees used for infrastructure. Just to make show that there are some significant differences, mm -hmm. however, uh, just consider that when you look at air transport, uh, well, airports have always been open to uh, any airline that wanted to land in that airport. Eventually the issue was that of discrimination. So you were making better, uh, lower fees for national companies. We've seen the Portuguese uh, case in which TAP and Portugalia were given um, more prefer preferential rates for local, uh, for domestic flights, but really it's very small, a small issue. Um, but generally speaking, uh, airports were open to, or anybody could land at an airport. So there was no issue at landing. What there was, what was discussion was, A, uh, what kind of how you charge, uh, what you ask for the use of the airport, and then who had, um, uh, could provide services at the airport. But once you've taken um, airports away, clearly the sky is free. You don't pay anything to fly in the sky. While if you have a train, you don't, it's obviously you need a station because if you don't have a station, the st people cannot embark and disembark on a train, but you need also an infrastructure. You need the tracks. 
So you must establish in a much more complex way what is the cost for using the tracks. While you in with air transport, you only have to establish what are the principles for airport fees, and you must ensure that they're sort of they're, they're transparent, proportional, non-discriminatory. So that's fine, but it's only the airport. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to uh, railways, rail transport, well, you must discuss not only how much you pay when you use the, the station, but also what happens, how much you must pay when you are using the tracks. So. As this is, you see it is somewhat more complex. This issue is somewhat more complex than the one that we've seen for air transport. So first issue, in the management independence of railway undertaking. So the management of the, of the, of the infrastructure must be separate obviously from the government. It is not the government that decides how the government that owns a, a railway owns the infrastructure and owns the, uh, owns the main railway company. Uh, well, the infrastructure manager must be independent. So must be able to decide according to what the best use of the, that infrastructure is. Secondly, separating the management of railway operation infrastructure from the provision of railway transport services. Clearly. You are Société Nationale Chemin de Fer, and you own the stations and the tracks, but you're also providing services. You are Ferrovie dello Stato, you're providing both the tracks and the railway services. You must separate them. So one entity owns and manages the infrastructure, another entity is owns the carriages, the engines, and provides passengers services for passengers or for uh, freight services. So clearly distinction between infrastructure and services on that infrastructure. So this is first very important distinction that must be made. And this obviously implies, and we've already met this notion before, separation of accounts. Why? Because both sectors, whether we are talking of infrastructures, and the infrastructure is generally financed by the state. And so lots of money goes from the state to the company that is managing the infrastructure. And the company that provides uh, public service obligations receives compensation. So you must have separation of accounts. So the monies that are given to the railway infrastructure company must be clearly separated from the monies that are given by the state for the uh, provision of public service obligations by uh, mm -hmm. the, the company that is providing uh, railway services. So it is separation of accounts. And uh, improving the financial structure of undertakings before, frankly speaking, the sort of balance sheets were very confusing. They were sort of, they, as they were, there was no issue of sort of losses because the, you knew that losses would be paid by the state. So you didn't, you weren't very con con concerned about accounts. Here you have to that now you have a very complex um, company and you must, it must be organized from a financial point of view, just as any other uh, big company. And secondly, the issue is that of ensuring access to the networks of member states for international groupings of railway undertakings and for undertakings engaged in the national combined transport of goods. Now, this is something, talking of 1991, 30 years ago, uh, in, because still the railway system had not developed very much. International groupings was saying, well, there'll be a grouping between, you know, uh, French railways and German railways, and they will organize uh, uh, international rail transport between uh, between France and Germany. Um, now, this is still, yes, is the case, but we're not very much interested in, in this aspect today, at least in the ages of high-speed train. In 1991, high-speed train has not, has only very started very limitedly, 
uh, very slowly and has started only in France. So just to point out that it is not mm, very relevant now. Um, let's look at the framework directive 440, uh, which contains a whole lot of uh, definitions which we still use. Railway undertaking, any private or public undertaking whose main business is to provide rail transport services for goods or for passengers with a requirement uh, that undertaking should ensure traction. So first of all, we are talking railway undertaking services. So it is not the owner of the infrastructure. It is providing services, passengers or goods, and it also has traction. It also has engines. If you only provide carriages, just think of the so-called Orient Express, this luxury train that you know used to go and well, still you still can take it from Paris, it leaves from Paris and goes way down to go to Istanbul. Okay, yes, but that is simply that's that is a service, the only the carriages, but no traction. So they're not they're not a railway undertaking. They're simply offering that this luxury. Um, old time, um, old time uh, service, but they are not a railway undertaking. You need traction. You need engines. If you have engines, and then for, and then you obviously you can have carriages. Then well, then you are railway undertaking. Infrastructure manager is instead any public body or undertaking responsible, in particular, for establishing and maintaining railway infrastructure as well as for operating the control and safety uh, system. So just to point out, very clear distinction between services and infrastructure. Infrastructure is physical. Uh, it is there, stations, tracks, electricity grid, signaling. So that is very clear. And um, services, obviously you have carriages and engines, but you have only that. You don't have anything else. You, from a physical point of view. What is important is the schedule, the fact that passengers board the train at a certain station, arrive <coughs> and disembark in another station. Uh, so in 2001, there's this idea that there's going to be sort of European transport policy for 2010 time to the side. Well, uh, it was slightly too optimistic, and um, the, um, uh, sort of the European uh, Union thought that in 10 years it could somehow come to the liberalization of, of rail transport. Things were much, much slower. So, uh, first element. Uh, Opening up national freight markets to cabotage. Remember, cabotage is when that's applied to transport. Remember when it was to concerning uh, concerning air transport. Um, originally, you if you were a German uh, airline, you could not provide domestic flights in France and vice versa. You could not provide therefore cabotage. So the fa fact that you are um, uh, uh, you are not belonging to that state, but you are providing services within that state and only within that state. What generally Ryanair does, uh, flights, Ryanair, Irish company, provides flights, domestic flights in Italy, in, 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 in France, Germany, and, uh, and uh, Spain. So that is typical cabotage. So the first point is cabotage for only for freight. So you are a German company and you are specialized in moving freight. Well, you are providing cabotage freight services in France or in Italy, and nobody can um, say anything. Uh, secondly, notion of interoperability, which is very significant because uh, networks are not uh, necessarily uh, coordinated, maybe they have different uh, uh, standards. Just think of the electricity, electricity grid. If there's a different tension of the electric uh, system, clearly trains cannot move, engines cannot move from one country to another, and then other whole lot of other technical specifications that somehow limit 
uh, possibility of trans-border uh, provision of services. Gradual opening up of international passenger services, so international passenger services, and then and we shall see this specifically when we're looking at the, at the rules model, uh, measures to safeguard the quality of rail services and users' rights. We shall see passengers' rights in the uh, rail sector. Um, so first, second railway package, main object improving safety, interoperability, and full opening of the freight market by 2007, an establishment of the European Railway Agency. We shall see its role. Then we see between 2004 in 2004, the implementation of the second package, Directive 49 on the safety. Uh, and uh, uh, so on safety of railways, this means clearly problem of standards of the amount of people who must work on the, on the, on the train to ensure safety. Then Directive number 50, on the trans-European high-speed rail system, this is what changes the whole system, high-speed train. Then Directive 51 on the development of the community uh, railways. And then finally, in always in 2004, a regulation that establishes a European railway agency, and we should see its role. Uh, so, Then, a few years later, 2007, so only three years later, we have other package of um, directives, two directives and three regulations. Directive 58, which concerns the possibility of allocation of railway infrastructure capacity and levying of charges for use of railway infrastructure. This is essential. This is the directive which is essential for liberalization. So you're starting to establish how third parties may use the infrastructure and how much they must pay for using the infrastructure. Just imagine you are a competitor of the national uh, railway service company and you want to use the infrastructure and uh, the company, the, we should see this is a typical example, the, the national company doesn't answer, does not provide you access to this infrastructure or ask for very high charges. So clearly regulation 58 is to establish, to regulate how you access, um, how you access, how you allow to access the infrastructure and how much you pay for using it for such. Directive 59 on certification of train drivers, just to remind you, we've done the same thing with pilots, so certification of pilots. And then we have three, um, uh, three regulations, one 1370, 1371, and 1372 on public passenger transport by rail and road, then we have another one on the passengers' rights and obligation. And then we have on the organization of um, sort of on the labor field. And we shall see how um, protection of workers in the railway sector is very strong. Then, so that is 2007. Then in 2011, that is again, another four years later, we have this white paper roadmap to a single European transport area. So that just as we try to implement a sort of single European skies and having sort of only one sky and therefore simplifying transport, uh, air transport within the European Union, uh, same thing, there's an attempt to do the same thing with rail transport. So a single European transport area should ease the movements of citizens and freight, 
reduce costs and enhance the sustainability of European transport. The area where bottlenecks are still most evident is the internal market for rail services, which must be completed as a priority in order to achieve a single European railway area. So here we see that same idea, just as we'd have single European skies, single European railway area. So substantially allowing anybody to move very easily from one country to another without any obstacles, without having to change train, without having to wait for, um, let's imagine the engine that must be changed because the standards are different and so on. Uh, this is uh, easier said than done. And we see that we are not very much, we haven't arrived uh, to this point to see abolishment of technical, administrative and legal of, um, obstacles. And so all these have to be somehow eliminated. First of all, liberalization of rail freight from 2007. Uh, and the idea was of passenger um, services from 2010. Didn't work in 2010 and we should have been opened up in 2020, but what has happened with the emergency, well, has uh, prevented us from, from having this uh, complete, this liberalization of um, passenger services. Separation, this is clearly management of infrastructure and passenger services, this has happened. Non-discriminatory setting of access charges and allocation of paths, again, this has, where there's been liberalization, this has happened. A rail regulator, therefore, an independent agency that was to regulate the rail sector, independent from the manager, and incentives to render the uh, infrastructure manager more efficient, European Railway Agent, Agency passenger rights. Just to point out, the uh, performance regime to incentivize the infrastructure manager, this is, uh, it's not only a question of, you know, of proper allocation of public resources. So you say, well, this is a public company, it is owned by the state and it should be well run. The problem is that what happens and this is very important, is that there is increasingly, as I've already mentioned, a significant competition between state-owned companies, railway companies, that are using a state-owned infrastructure and privately owned uh, airlines. So just think a certain route, which is offered by a railway company, uh, owned by the state and which is paid by the state. And then you have a privately owned company, Ryanair, which is provided on that same uh, distance is providing uh, certain, uh, certain services. So one service is paid by the state and financed, subsidized by the state. And which state can say, oh, but I can spend all the money I want because anyhow, it's always, um, it's taxpayer who's going to pay for this. And uh, the private company, which let Ryanair says, hey, but I have received no, no, no monies from the state. So this competition is unfair. It is not on the same level field. I have to pay for the airport. I have to pay for the um, aircraft, my uh, pilots, crew, and so on. And you're paying for everything. So you are this competition between high-speed trains, which are using public infrastructure paid by the taxpayer, and myself, this is something that obviously I cannot, uh, I cannot have, do. it is not a fair competition. So just to point out that this uh, performance regime to incentivize infrastructure managers is somehow a way to encourage managers to reduce the cost and therefore to make it more uh, competitively uh, compliant, and not simply to have a, a company which can spend as much as it wants and without any concern for uh, competition issues. Now, let's uh, see what, when we try to implement these, um, these, uh, these principles, 
First of all, failure, this independence of infrastructure manager from train operators, well, this is, was much more difficult. I mean, you find in also in Italy, where there is maybe the country with most competition in the field of uh, railway transport, well, the uh, railway manager, uh, company, uh, same holding, Ferrovia dello Stato, is controls two uh, companies, the Rete Ferroviaria Italiana, which is the uh, infrastructure manager, which owns the stations and the tracks from Trenitalia, which instead provides passenger services. The same uh, holding controls two different entities, and so clearly the infrastructure manager is not independent from the train operators, they are parent companies. Then, secondly, insufficient implementation of the charging framework, including a lack of required performance regime. So what you're saying, how much are you going to charge for the use of the infrastructure? And obviously the charge must be related to the performance, how functional this uh, infrastructure is. Failure to establish an independent regulator with appropriate powers and accessibility. So the fact that it took at least 10 years before uh, an independent regulatory agency was created for the railway sector and uh, insufficient incentives for the infrastructure manager to reduce costs and the level of access charges. Clearly, uh, look at it like this. I have an infrastructure. Let's imagine my infrastructure costs 100. Obviously, I when someone wants to use my infrastructure, I will say my costs are 100 per year each year. So if you're using my infrastructure for one day, let's imagine one day, well, you will pay me, have to pay me, I will have to recover at least one fraction, one of out of 365 of that what I have spent of my cost. So clearly you, uh, from an economic point of view, from a managerial point of view, you are transferring the cost of the infrastructure on the users of that infrastructure. It's the same thing that happens with a hotel. What is the cost of a hotel room? Obviously, how much the building costs, how much the uh, maintenance of the building costs, how much uh, obviously cleaning and all the other services cost. And then you will somehow transfer this cost on the user of the hotel plus obviously profits. So it is a very simple scheme. The point is this, that if you are a monopolistic enterprise, which manages the infrastructure, knows that there's no problem about repaying that, you will keep, uh, you will keep your costs very high because you know that you're going to be repaid, especially that that will be a barrier to entry to the market, your cost are very high, and therefore someone who wants to use your infrastructure, a third party, that wants to use your infrastructure, will you pay very high? So what you must do is reduce the cost and especially avoid unnecessary cost, duplication of cost, mm, any kind of, so you must somehow reduce the cost of the infrastructure because you know that the cost of infrastructure will be transferred to the users and therefore will diminish the competition. While obviously originally when the infrastructure manager and the passenger services well, the same company it was no problem. I mean, it doesn't is quite irrelevant. It's, everything is going. Taxpayer is going to pay any loss. Here is that you, if the costs are very are kept artificially very high, this prevents uh, prevents um, competitors from entering the market because the charges are too high. So, what do we have in two thousand twelve? Other free. Uh, another um, directive uh, which merges these three directives 91 and the two of 95. And uh, what does it say? The rules applicable to the management of railway infrastructure and to rail transport activities, the criteria applicable to the issuing and renewal of licenses uh, for those railway undertakings, you need a license, and the principles and procedures applicable to the setting and collecting of railway infrastructure charges and allocation 
of railway infrastructure capacity. So you're st establishing how you access the infrastructure and what is the cost you must pay to access the infrastructure. Then the, this new directive, sorry, this directive, 2034 of 2012 uh, establishes the rule for the management of the railway infrastructure, uh, issuing a renewal of licenses, setting and collecting of railway infrastructure charges. And it uses, it applies, this is the important thing, not only to international rail services, but also to domestic rail services. So what do we see until substantially the 2012, the intervention of the European Union was mostly in the field of international rail transport. From 2012 onwards, it's also domestic. So what you are trying to do is open up the domestic uh, railway services to third, uh, third parties. Now, uh, what are the main competition issues that are uh, come up? Uh, obviously, you want to improve transparency because if there's no transparency, if you don't know what the costs are and how they are set, obviously you are we don't want to enter the market. So, more detailed network statements. What does a network statement mean? It means all the information of the network. Now, this seems to us lawyers not very important, but from a technical point of view, if you don't have all the information on a certain network, you can't send your own train or you can't know if your train can go on that network. I have, let's imagine I'm an Italian uh, train operator and I want to operate in Germany. I don't have network statements. I don't know if my trains I have built uh, on Saldo Breda, which is a producer of uh, engines, and um, my carriages can use a certain German infrastructure. So this is the first element. Improved access to re-rail uh, related services. Just think of uh, rail related, just think of cleaning um, when you have to clean passenger uh, cars or you must provide catering on board. Explicit rules on conflicts of interest and discriminatory mm. practices in rail related services because we know that in all European countries there is the state owns at the same time uh, the infrastructure and the company, the main state, uh, the main railway services company. So there's clearly a conflict of interest. Independence requirements to the operators of essential service facilities to storage sidings and refueling facilities. So just to, you want to ensure that there's not, no discrimination, third parties that need to have that kind of uh, side activities. Just think of a train that arrives at night, must uh, be prepared, it must be maintained and so on. So you want to be sure that there's going to be no discrimination against third party. New provisions on financial transparency that allow very verification of separation of financial flows between so separate accounts uh, to avoid cross subsidiation. Second element of the Directive 34 of 2012, regulatory oversight so national rail regulator, which has to control also um, rail, uh, rail services, it must be independent and uh, there must be a European network of, your, of uh, rail regulators which exchange experiences and ideas. Clearly the whole, if you want to create a common a single European market for railway services, obviously regulators must, who are setting the rules must somehow be uh, coordinated. And again, financial investment, financial architecture to encourage investment by including national long-term strategies and uh, 
principles when it comes to charging rules. Uh, um, so the whole idea is that of um, adapting um, railway uh, charges to the different services and have them more um, set out in a more proportionate ways. We shall see it now with this 2016 uh, directive how these principles have been changed. Now, um, what we're going to do now, before moving to the force package, um, are they are there any questions for concerning um, what we've seen today? Listen, I would just want to do that for next week. If you go to the handbook, you see that there are three cases concerning the second module, um, cases 11, 12, and 13. So what I would do is uh, um, um, I would just simply put them in uh, disorder, case 11 for a police, case 12 for uh, Asayag and case 13 for Galea, um, um, Wednesday, respectively, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, a police this Deutsche Bahn versus Commission is a pretty interesting case on sort of its freight, but it shows uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, art substantially Article 101 agreements. Uh, which are discriminatory. So it's a very nice competition case and shows also intermodality, how intermodality can work and has to do with uh, a sort of relationship between ports and, uh, and, uh, and railway infrastructure. So that's the first case for next Wednesday. Uh, then the second case, uh, GBG versus Ferrovia dello Stato, or Asayag, this is a case in which uh, Ferrovia start or the incumbent substantially uh, prevents GVG from entering the market with sort of usual, u usual preposterous arguments sort of somehow preventing uh, an, um, a third party from entering, entering into the market. Now this is not that Ferrovia start is worse than any other company, it's just sort of typical behavior of the mon monopolistic state-owned uh, company which wants to prevent uh, third uh, parties from entry. And then the third case instead is um, a case of DB nets. It's the problem of uh, uh, conflicts of interest, uh, conflict of interest in Germany, Deutsche Bahn, and the relationship of uh, who sets the rules and who provides services. So this is again, so not, there's not much litigation in the field of uh, Air transport services, and as a matter of fact, the European Court of Justice has not had a significant role as it has had for air transport. Why, when it comes to air transport, the, the landscape is set by the European Court of Justice in the rail sector. No, and we see this, uh, we see that at least until now, there's not been all that liberalization, and the European Court of Justice has, has had a very sort of much less. Uh, um, strong, um, uh, uh, strong approach to a liberalization of, uh, of services or railway services. So there's not, not much, but anyhow, these three cases give us an idea of how the system, how the system works. Now, having said this, uh, what do we have now? We have this Force railway package. Now, this force railway package should have really substantially entered into force in 2020, and um, unfortunately, things have um, have not gone as expected. But some things have been put into place, but uh, clearly, with uh, limited mobility uh, around Europe, but obviously, also railway mobility is strongly impaired. But just to show how the European Union has been moving with, with uh, regards to um, railway transport. So 
what do we find? This false, false package. So we find a regulation and two directives. Uh, one on the European Union Agency for Railways. So we've moved from the European Railway Agency to European Union Agency for Railways. Just remember, more or less, uh, this is what has happened in the in the um, air, air transport sector with the creation of EASA, the European uh, Aviation Safety Agency, which there's a safety, but really regulates enormous amount of other activities. So the same idea is that of creating an agency, a European agency for uh, for railways. Um, we should see that, however, that the European Railway Agency worked quite well for a certain amount of reasons that we shall analyze in detail. Secondly, this directive uh, of 797 interoperability of rail system, which is mostly technical, but clearly uh, you understand that uh, if you want uh, these networks to be connected and you want a high speed train to be, go be able to go from Frankfurt to Paris, uh, which oh, they already are, but uh, they, which is not all that near because it does Paris, uh, Gatineau goes to Strasbourg and then goes to Frankfurt. Mm, it's, quite a distance, but if you want sort of a seamless uh, high-speed uh, train, obviously this means interoperability of, of uh, networks and having ensuring obviously that the high-speed train can go without any problem from France to Germany. And uh, uh, Directive 798 on railway safety and um, I mean trains first uh, um, sort of uh, strict liability rules in Europe were introduced in Germany at the end of the 19th century concerning railway transport. So railway transport has always been somehow subject to uh, specific rules because they were considered dangerous. Uh, but uh, uh, this issue becomes very, very important when you see that uh, high-speed trains travel at 300, 400, maybe even 500 kilometers per hour. So which is the speed of, a, of, of an aircraft and but with many more passengers, high-speed trains of Jenny carry, well, 500, 800 uh, passengers. So if something happens, it does, uh, issue of safety is a very, very significant issue in, uh, in rail transport, especially when it comes to, uh, to, um, to uh, high-speed trains. Obviously, we're not talking of freight because if if you uh, if you are carrying inflammable uh, products, that's something different. But we're looking at passenger transport, high-speed trains that travel at incredibly high speed. Obviously, we're not at the level of of uh, uh, Japanese and and Chinese trains that go well already go well over 500 kilometers per hour. But um, the, the sort of the, the issues of uh, of safety are very important. And so this this is the technical pillar. Then there's the market pillar, which is uh, regulation twenty three thirty eight on the award of public service contracts. Substantially, the principles set out in the Altmark decision are put in a regulation. Then. Directive on the 2370, opening of the market of domestic passenger transport services by rail and governance of the railway infrastructure. So this has to do with opening the domestic passengers, somehow allowing foreign companies to establish themselves in a different country and to provide railway services in that country. And then Regulation 2337 on the accounts of uh, railway undertakings. What we are mostly interested in is this Regulation 2370, because this is what should have come into force in 2020, opening up the market, allowing uh, sort of competitors to provide uh, services in uh, in competition with with um, 
um, with uh, the national monopolistic, the traditional and national domestic uh, monopolistic company. Now, uh, what uh, we will stop uh, for today, I'll stop here because there's some whole lot of complex issues. But just to point out that we shall see that when it comes to liberalization of, um, of uh, uh, rail transport, substantially rail uh, passenger services. So we're talking of passenger services. Set aside freight, freight is quite liberalized, not completely, but by now it is, you can provide, uh, there are many companies that provide, uh, especially in, in Northern Europe, where there's an enormous amount of uh, freight that is moved uh, by rail, especially coming from the Atlantic, the sort of North Sea ports, uh, Belgium, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, and Germany, and moving from there to the rest of Europe, mostly Central and Eastern Europe. Um, uh, so we're not going to consider freight. Let's consider passenger. Um, when it comes to liberalization of passenger services, that is, new companies that can compete with the incumbent state-owned uh, passenger service company, Italia, Spagna, I mean Deutsche Bahn, I mean the national champions, uh, we have various models which are quite interesting from a regulatory point of view, but also from an economic point of view. And we shall see how uh, some countries have followed one uh, route one way of liberalization, other countries have followed a different route. So this is also interesting from, we see that there's a, a traditional English model, which has substantially been quite unsuccessful, while liberalization of services in the UK, starting already in the 80s, has generally been very successful in most fields, typically air transport, but also other services. When it comes to rail transport, it has been uh, substantially a failure. It has not delivered what it was expecting, and this we shall see why. Uh, but some countries, we look at the Spanish case, that somehow has tried to follow the, the, um, the English case, the English model, and um, uh, while Italy has followed a different, a different system. But this is very important because just as we've seen how important in air transport the difference between the hub and spoke model. There's a hub and then there are spokes, and that is a traditional model of a railway, um, of a, how a railway, of a, um, an airline has worked throughout decades. Uh, and then there's a the low cost model set up by Ryanair, point to point. You go fly from small airport, regional airport to a big town or by rather, not a big town, to an airport near a big town. It could be Beauvais, it could be Charleroi, it could be Champino. Anyhow, you're moving to another, to another, to another uh, airport and from just simply point to point. So there are two di these two different models that we have seen in, uh, in air transport. We must try to see how they apply with regards to uh, rail transport, these two different models which are substantially a network model or a franchise model of on routes, on origin and destination routes. So we'll have to analyze this more in detail, but we shall see this um, more in detail. I would like to see this uh, tomorrow because it is um, makes a significant difference on how these, these systems work. So for the moment that we can we can close our lesson uh, here for today, and we reconvene for tomorrow at uh, uh, quarter past uh, quarter past two. And I trust you, all three of you, have taken note of the notice of the three cases you must present next week. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Just something. Uh, I won't be able to be here tomorrow. Sorry. Okay. 
You're going on holiday. I hope you're taking no, no, you're taking no. a day, day off. I mean, here before before there's a there's a French lockdown before Lazio becomes a, a red region. You know, it's sort of it's 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 rather depressing. So you say, but then you speak with someone from another other place, say, oh, but oh, I'm yellow. I'm my my region is yellow. Yours is red. So you can't do anything. And I have a medical uh, appointment. Uh, well, well, no, but take advantage of. Well, let's hope that I mean those who are in. I mean, France is in difficult lockdown, and uh, I don't know Malta. How are you now in Malta? Have you been in? Have you been increasing your restrictions? Um, with regards to restrictions, no, but the cases have been rising. All right. So, but we, we're not in a lockdown here. Hmm. Well, because in, uh, now in sort of some regions, uh, typically Lombardia <clears throat> uh, is uh, is a red region, and, and Lombardia is 10 million inhabitants, so it's a very big region. It's the biggest from a geographical and from population point of view, biggest uh, region in Italy, which is a red region with very stringent, uh, uh, very substantially lockdown, very difficult to, to start moving about and so on. So. Uh, hope and why Lazio Rome is uh, yellow. It's not green. It's yellow. We have restrictions from 10 to 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. But sort of it's bearable. One can somehow we can survive. But hoping that we are not sort of transformed into a into a red region. Okay. Then see you tomorrow, Nasa Yagwell. Uh, I'll we. We'll, You'll be able to see the, the lessons on uh, recorded on YouTube. Okay. Goodbye. Good afternoon to everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.